Goedendag, dit is Razo, de omroep uit Zuidoost. En vandaag een programma over Nepal. Dat wil zeggen over een Nepalese dichter, Yujutsi Sharma, die in Amsterdam op bezoek is. Die ook samen met Amsterdamse dichters werk maakt en publiceert. Maar die vooral uit Nepal komt. En op deze manier slaan we dus weer bruggen. Bruggen tussen culturen, bruggen tussen verschillende denkrichtingen. En de brug die je hier ziet is over een rivier in Nepal. En u ziet het, dat is vrij primitief. Niet alleen kunnen er geen auto's over, maar alles moet gedragen worden. Het is een echte hangbrug. Nuncio Caponio is Italiaan, heeft een hele tijd films gemaakt in allerlei landen in de wereld. En hij is nu in Amsterdam en maakt televisie. Engelstalig, want het gesprek met onze dichter Yujutsi Sharma is in het Engels. Er worden ook gedichten voor gedragen en we hopen dat dit programma u... Zal amuseren. Bruggen slaan. Daar gaat het om in Zuidoost. Tussen culturen. Veel plezier met Nuncio en Jujutsu Sharma. So this is my favorite poem called River that I read here. Between your marble shoulders and my hairy chest, the river roaring tears, tears, tears. Between your marble shoulders and my hairy chest, the river roaring tears, tears, tears. Between your mellowing mouth and my center tongue, a night of flames and flesh and flesh and flesh. Between your hefty thighs and my throbbing hands, clouds drunk from the forest of rhododendrons, rhododendrons, rhododendrons. Between your almond eyes and my warm mouth, rain dropping like pearls of green leaves of the jungle. Between your shimmering skin and my dark hair, grass greener than the greenest parakeet, growing yellowish from incessant rain. Between your nights by the important pillow of your husband and my crazed headpiece. A poem of spring that shall fill my deep wounds, sprouting flowers, flowers, flowers. Between your tulips and my fragrant pen, a brain fever bird's crazed cry, mad, mad, mad. Between the sparkle of your teeth and my sleep, a rain coming like a roar of a starving stream in the starless summer gloom of the night. Between your melon breasts, and thrust of my soft lips, the rage of the river battering its head against the magic mountains, between your decisions and my flickering lamps, the river mad. Between your decisions and my flickering lamps, the river mad, you, you poet, you bastard, go away. Good evening. My name is Annunzio Caponio. And we're here today to talk about something which is very, well, literally, we can say very poetic. We have an evening talking about poetry, about uh, what inspires you know, to write poetry. And we have this uh, evening with a very special person. With, um, here with uh, Yuyutsu Ardi Sharma. Welcome. Thank you. And he's a special man because uh, he's a poet, he's a columnist, he works for the um, Kathmandu Post and he's involved in many, literally, um, activities around the world. And he's almost um, a messenger. You bring uh, um, this link between uh, um, Nepal, where he's from and where he's based, uh, with Amsterdam, with uh, France, with Italy, with uh, Germany. And we're going to find out more as uh, we're going to talk you know, through tonight. Welcome to the, um, this evening. Yes, thank you. Sir. And you're here in Europe at the moment, it's, and it's very, very interesting um, what you're doing. I mean, all these activities, you just come back from the, the Frankfurt you know, Book Fair. Uh, you're traveling around Europe, you're going through many different cities. Can you tell us more about this, uh, um, this network that you're bringing? Uh, well, um, <clears throat> I came to Europe uh, as uh, basically to uh, promote uh, my book uh, uh, recently published called The Lake Favour and a Horse. Uh, I was at Frankfurt Book Fair, and I was uh, trying to uh, get in uh, uh, the publicity and uh, trying to meet writers and uh, promote the book. 
And then I had uh, an invitation from uh, Holland uh, um, to, to come here and to, to study and to Dutch literature and to work on Dutch literature. And after this, I have uh, some readings in uh, Paris and I would be going to Italy in the end uh, to, uh, as a, a Rocky Feller um, fellow to uh, work on my new book called Annapurna Poems. All right. uh, so this is a literary tour and um, I'll be back briefly uh, to Nepal uh, to meet my family and my people and my friends. And uh, so, uh, and I'm uh, enjoying here. This is quite an exciting moment for me uh, because I, I came here uh, first time to Europe I could not come because my mother was very ill, but, uh, and then after she passed away two years ago, uh, then because I could never ever come before because I thought if something happens to her, uh, I would never ever forgive me because if I'm in Europe, I can never come go back. So uh, two years ago she expired, so then I felt so lonely and so upset and uh, I was absolutely, um, you know, shattered. And I thought, um, you know, to get some, um, some peace and some, uh, some change of place, you know, which helps in, in bringing uh, the emotional turmoil down, uh, I, I'm visiting now, and I do not have to worry about her because um, there's nothing now that can happen to her. So this is a kind of very personal journey, and as well as a, a, a kind of official uh, thing of uh, to promoting my uh, my literature, my country's literature, the whole Indian subcontinent, Nepal, Nepalese uh, poets, Nepalese writers, and introducing uh, Dutch literature, uh, German literature, French literature to my readers who read my columns. And, and getting uh, the translations across, getting them translated into Indian languages in Nepali, Hindi, Punjabi, Bengali. Uh, so this is, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm working uh, in this way to, to promote, uh, and also to promote tourism uh, in Nepal, because Nepal at the moment needs, uh, uh, as, is, as it is passing through a very turbulent phase, uh, a lot of, uh, mm, lot of uh, crisis in Nepal. So I, I, it's, uh, but uh, this is a good opportunity to promote uh, Nepalese tourism. Uh, because ne Nepal is very peaceful. It is not as, uh, as um, disturbing as it looks from <laughs> outside. So uh, it's, it's a golden opportunity for me to do many things. Uh, so I'm in a way very happy. That's very, very interesting indeed. Can, uh, um, let's, we can track back, you know, what is your background, you know, with um, how you got into poetry. And uh, originally you're from India. You were yes, born in yes, India yes. and then you moved into Nepal. Can you tell us more about it? how this transition, I mean, how you got yourself involved with, uh, with poetry, how you got there, your inspiration, because I mean, we know that in India we have the, the classicals of India that probably are not well known in the world, but um, how it, it is you know, to, to be born in India and with a strong literature, how was the influence and how you find that link between the classical and yourself finding your true nature and expression in combination with what you're finding here in Europe? Yes. Uh, it's a very interesting question, in fact, because uh, uh, this is, uh, I was born in Punjab, uh, you know, when I was born after uh, the, uh, the partition of India and Pakistan. I was born in 1960, like, and the whole thing was over. Uh, but then uh, I, w I became part of uh, the whole Indian subcontinent in the sense that uh, I grew up in Punjab, and I, I went over to Rajasthan to study. And I, uh, there, it's there that I met uh, this American poet called David Ray, who encouraged me to write uh, poetry and who introduced me to uh, the large uh, framework, the large circle of American writers like Allen Ginsberg, Robert Bly, or John Ashbery. And, and then before that, I used to write short stories and uh, criticism. Okay. But when I met this poet, and he was, on a, he was an Indo-US fellow. He was very, very, he's very, very representative poet, very major poet of uh, America. And then he was there for one year. Uh, so he, meeting him uh, inspired me a lot. And after that, I did my, my research on him and uh, like my, my, my thesis on him. And this gave me an opportunity to look into the world literature and its framework. And, uh, and then I had my, my, as you said, my traditional, uh, my, my tradition of writing poetry. Yes. Because poetry, fiction is new thing for us. Fiction mm. goes from Europe. Yeah. But uh, poetry is our own. Like since the times of Vedas, yeah, we have our own poetry. We, I have... Uh, you know, so much confidence uh, because uh, uh, we know it from the childhood. Like when I was five year old, I used to recite uh, shlokas of some Sanskrit, or I used to, I could tell by heart when I was five year old, um, Ramayana, some of the incidents. I could narrate the story. And that's why uh, my father used to go to uh, these Naga ascetics and the Naga saints, the religious, you know, in temples. And I was named by them. They named me uh, Ramdas. 
That's my original oh, name. Oh. And that means uh, Lord's servant. They thought this boy is very religious. He knows uh, culture so much. He knows uh, the stories of Mahabharata, Ramayana, and he knows uh, Vedas. And like I could recite when I was five years old, I could recite um, the mantras. I could recite Gayatri Mantra by heart. You just knew them? or uh, my, Because them my or family how? background, because yes. my grandmother and my, my grandfather, they were very religious. And in the morning, I will get up and I will see them praying and ringing the bells yes. and praying to the God. And uh, these things went naturally into me, so oh, I could I could learn. So this, so I have very long associations with the, with the, um, uh, my ancient uh, literary traditions. So what was in the you know in the literal I mean in the sense when you uh, the window to the west you know was open for you, what did you find that was so fascinating on the other side that you really um, you were moved by it? You know, coming coming from such a strong strong background, and then you find yourself in. Uh, uh, a completely different uh, um, um, frame of thought. Well, uh, yeah, this is very interesting because uh, when I I was brought up in this uh, uh, pan-Indian tradition, this Vedic tradition, uh, which was very, 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 very orthodox Hindu kind of uh, upbringing. But then when I went to university, I took up uh, English literature and uh, American literature yes. to, to research. And with that also, because I was, when I was a small child, I, I had so much of religious influence that I, I became a shaman at a state. When I was about eight year old, people thought I'm a shaman, I'm a child shaman. Then I could tell people's future. Then I could tell what could happen in, in future. That somehow disturbed me because I was too young to, people respected me a lot, but I was too young to accept that. So when I, I learned, when I went to school and I learned science and I learned Western education, I sort of felt relieved because I got rid of these miracles and these, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> so that's and I felt a little easy that I said, oh, I, now there's no fear because uh, science analyzes everything so, so scientifically, so logically. Yes. And then I don't have to worry uh, any, any, any ghost or any, any spirit or anything. You know, I was under the spell that um, some ghosts or some spirit comes in me and I tell people. But now I know that uh, that was very good. Oh, I see your point. So After basically, the years, I think I was, I was listening some voice. I was listening a true voice. But Western education, they killed it, that, uh, that innocence in me. So it's, it's, the conflict goes on, you know, it is, yeah. it's very complicated because uh, then I was very happy when I, was, I went to school and I learned science and I could analyze things, why man dies, how earth came into being, yes. how, uh, how evolution of human beings uh, took place and all the questions about, about the, the ultimate questions I could answer. Then I became very happy. But now I see that uh, I have, I have, uh, science has not answered any of my questions. They are I am still where I was. So in a way I feel that... Um, I'm again uh, studying books on shamanism. I'm, I'm trying to study the invisible, the, 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 uh, the, the irrational, the schizophrenic, you know. I'm, I'm again a poet. I'm, 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 I'm trying to explore uh, the unexplorable. So this, this makes me a poet now. So this, I have seen both the world and I know the, the, the intricacies of both. So now I think uh, with both I can, I can uh, be a poet and I can be a writer. So you feel that you're more balanced? at this point. I mean, knowing what's going yeah. on in the West and yes. uh, having this very strong background from, from your own culture, uh, now you feel you're kind of balanced. It's almost, uh, you have all the tools, you know, to actually be able to discern, you know, what is what. And you're using poetry as a medium to actually get into these, um, in the, in the, into those worlds, I mean, as well. Yeah, I think that's to some extent very true because uh, uh, I'm writing a novel as well now. And my, this, this theme is very important in my novel and I'm, because um, my novel deals with uh, this kind of miracles and how um, a Western uh, educated man tackles them and works over them. So uh, this way, and then um, uh, it, it is very crucial that we understand that there are miracles happening around us, that miracles can happen, that man is not just a biological item because uh, science uh, kind of limits man into a biological thing mm. and it, it, the clinical science sort of reduces him into a, because soul is a, a absolutely, a, you know, thrown out of any scientific research. But soul and spirit is important and it can do miracles, like it can cure. Because I, I see shamans, I go to the villages and someone has a problem in leg or in stomach and he goes and the shaman does something and he says, yeah, I'm, I'm all right. This guy gets all right because he believes in them. Yes. I cannot believe because I have, I have known Western education. I have, I have been educated. This, be, this becomes trouble for me. 
But don't you think that, uh, in, in a way, now you feel that coming back to your roots, you know, it's a, it's a more powerful um, way to understand uh, the, the world? In a sense, because we find you know, that science actually is uh, reaching uh, the point where it's meeting uh, religion. And, and we find you know, where quantum uh, physics is getting to the point where it's almost using the same statement that were made um, thousands of years ago yes, by the yes. sage of, uh, of yes. the East. So in a sense, don't you find that you yourself, you're going to be in a, such a situation at one point, is it? Yes, very, very much. I, I, am, I will illustrate your, uh, what you're saying in a very beautiful story that is in our scriptures. Uh, Lord Vishnu, our God, uh, he's traveling with Narada, another, another God, small God, and both are traveling in a jungle. And Lord Vishnu uh, says, my son, I'm thirsty. Go and bring me a jug of water. This smaller God goes, this yeah. deity, he goes to the river, and he sees, when he wants to take the water out of the, um, this thing, uh, river, he sees a beautiful woman there. He falls in love with her. And he proposes her, he marries her. He, has, he, he settles down as a household guy. He has children by her. Many years pass. Then one day, he has grandchildren. He grows old. He like, the children are growing up. And he, many years pass, like 80 years or 50 years. Then one day he remembers that he had come here to drink, to get water from the Lord. He was supposed to fetch water for the Lord. Yeah. He, has, he didn't come here to marry and to settle. <laughs> and he rushes back. <laughs> After many years. And he, he gets a glass, you know, this uh, jug of water, says, Lord, I have brought this uh, thing for you. And you know what Lord says? Lord says, my son, I have been waiting for half an hour. Where were you? You see the relative of, the relativity of time? Oh, I see. What is a whole lifetime for this smaller God is only half an hour for Vishnu. I mean, it, is yeah. all, it all existed. And that, uh, very true. And that brings back you know, to the concept that, uh, that time is irrelevant, really. Yes. And that different realities yes. and different, uh, uh, have a different time frame. Well, this is very, very interesting indeed. And uh, how do you um, find, in, you know, coming here to Europe, and it seems like you're working also with uh, poets from Amsterdam, yes. and you're going to work on a publication because of one of the things that you do as well, you have a monthly uh, publication. Uh, actually, I think it comes out every three months, three right? Months, yes, quarterly. Um, for, um, for poets yes. of uh, Nepal. And now you're going to do an issue based on uh, uh, poets from Amsterdam. Yes, sure. Uh, I have this literary magazine. Yes. In, and this uh, Pratik. Oh. And this magazine uh, works, uh, uh, it is, I have been running this for the last 10 years. So now we will be bringing a special issue of uh, Dutch literature. We will be publishing a lot of Dutch thing. literature uh, on, in this magazine. And similarly, we will be doing the same thing with the uh, French and um, German and other writers. But first I want to do with uh, Dutch literature. And uh, how do you find that poetry? How do you find the way they express themselves? How, there's any differences from, um, where are you from and the people you met? I mean, each country has a specific characteristic or you find everybody uh, express himself from, from, from the soul or, yes. and, and there's a certain communal aspect to it. Well, I'm uh, I'm researching it now and I'm trying to work on it. I see a lot of similarities that Nepal has or India has with Dutch literature, especially Nepal because Nepal is a small place and uh, b between two giants, India and China. And uh, Netherlands is like between two big countries three big countries, England, France, and, you know, Germany. So I see a lot of similarity. And uh, I see, uh, like, a lot of impact of uh, Indian impact, the, like, like Beatles had, or like Allen Ginsberg's impact, or, or Kali, or deities, or cultural, Hindu, religious, or 60s, you know, that, that comes from Kathmandu. Like Kathmandu, as one of my friends was saying, Kathmandu is, uh, uh, Amster Amsterdam is uh, Kathmandu of West. You see? Oh, I see, yeah. So it's, it, it has a kind of cultural value. Like I, was, I go to restaurants, I sometimes feel that I am in Kathmandu. Yeah, it actually, it's very true because, I mean, the little street here in yes. Amsterdam yes, yes. with all the little restaurants, yes, I mean, yes, they're yes. very much, you know, reminds of uh, Kathmandu. So uh, there, there are a lot of similarities and there are a lot of, and especially poetry. Uh, there's a lot of intensity. And there's a lot of that, uh, that uh, the spiritual uh, kind of quest that there is. And there are also a lot of... Uh, a lot of uh, social concerns that, that are similar to, to, our, uh, to our culture. And also a lot of Indian impact, uh, Indian, pan-Indian uh, kind of, because um, Europeans, especially Dutch people, have been traveling a lot. 
mm. and a lot of uh, lot of Asia, the, the kind the concept of multiculturalism uh, that it has imbibed, it has it, it has kind of uh, taken in. So it, it, in a way, uh, I think uh, Dutch literature is not as uh, as uh, a purist kind of literature. Or it's not just Dutch literature. It has it has a lot of impact of India, uh, Oriental impact. Yes. So which is uh, which is very interesting. And I would be working on this aspect. And when I have, I'm uh, I'm I'm working with the uh, several uh, Dutch poets, especially with the Harry Zevenberger, who is uh, who is the, who will be the, probably the guest editor of this wonderful issue. So and I'm talking to others, Hans Flomp and Simon and other people. So yeah, I nice. think uh, it would something good uh, would come out of this, and uh, we will have articles, we have interviews, we'll have poetry, and you know we, it will be an extensive issue. Very it nice. will be a double issue of this. May uh, let's say I would like to talk about you know your latest book, right? Yes. And uh, this book, you know, is um, you've been to the Frankfurt um, Book Fair with this book, you know, to promote it, and and this book is based on uh, the Annapurna. Yes which is an enchanted uh, yes. place, I mean, really beautiful. I mean, I had the fortune you know, to, to be there, so we kind of, we're talking about places that really triggers <laughs> uh, lots of beautiful memories for me yes. as well. And c can you tell me about this book, you know, how it came about, you know, how you decided to write the book and the inspiration, and tell us a little bit about Annapurna, which is this magical place where, where the poetry is based on. Yes. Well, this, uh, I started about 10 years ago writing this book, and this book is the first uh, in the series of the books that I shall be writing. After this, I shall be writing another book called An Around Annapurnas. So it's called Annapurna Poems. Uh -huh. And uh, that's what I have got, uh, this Rocky Fellow Fellowship, that I'll be working on Annapurna Poems. Uh, so I went to Annapurnas about uh, uh, a decade ago. Before that, I, I knew, but I didn't go to that area much. Because uh, Nepalese don't go for you know, tourism much. So, and then my, uh, some friends in prompted me, you know, I saw, in a restaurant, in a, 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 a kind of stag, a tag said, don't keep saying I will go there one day. And I read that and I said, my God, I have to go. Don't keep saying I will go there one day. And I packed my bag and I rushed. And I went to Pokhara and the moment I saw this lake, I was in love with it. And I could not, uh, just, I thought, my God, this is where I belong. And then the, the, the lake is source of all those Himalayan glaciers and I, I tracked it was initially, it was like I thought a tree house track, a three day track, I go and come back. I didn't even carry my proper luggage, I didn't carry, carry a sleeping bag. But when I went there, it, and I ended up in the Annapurna base camp. Because it was so romantic and so enchanting. And like, like a pilgrimage. And lots of people going, especially Dutch people, French people, a lot of them go. So it was, and since that, I have been going there twice a year. And you know, in our scriptures, it is said that uh, Himalayas, Annapurnas, they are called Devatatma. And Devatatma in uh, Sanskrit means the place where souls of the gods live. So when you reach there, at the highest mountain, on the rooftop of the world, you feel the presence of the souls of the gods. You feel you are... You, you can share, you can, you can have this, this throbbing feeling, that calm, that quiet, serene atmosphere as you have experienced in, the, in, in Ghorepani, in Jomsum, in Muktinath, in Gandruk, in Tatopani, in Hot Springs, or in Manang, as you, as you cross and you circle around the glacials, yes. and, and there are no roads, and the mules, and the people laughing, dancing. That's, and, and that's what... When I came to Europe, that's what I, I, I lacked. When I got down the airplane, I went to uh, uh, Frankfurt, and I got into the train, and I was shocked to see that nobody was smiling, and they were like, quiet, and it stunned me. Because in, uh, in Annapurnas, or in a bus, local bus there, if you come down, and people will be dancing, they will be singing, telling stories, gossiping, maybe teasing each other. I mean, it's all full of romance and full of life. But here I saw in the, in the tram in Frankfurt, people sitting and just stunned and not, not, nobody smiling. So this has been a kind of quite a shock. Uh, that uh, uh, it, it, it is, uh, the contrasts are very vivid in this. <laughs> so I try to, uh, I'm trying to react to this and I'm trying to see. In fact, I didn't see much of uh, you know Europe in that. It's not much different. It's nothing new for me because in Asia, I'll be due to globalization, we have a lot of Europe already. 
we have a lot of uh, trams and a lot of um, skyscrapers. And South Delhi is just like Amsterdam or, or, or say, uh, Frankfurt. I, in South Delhi, if you go, it's as posh and as nice. And as we have trams. And we have, but uh, what I lacked here was the, the lively you know, appearance and the smiling faces. Mm. Uh, probably it's because of weather or because of, you know, I do not know. But uh, it's like very inwards. And, so this, this is a little, I'm trying to go more in, into details. And so it's, it's, uh, and that's what I'm, what I'm writing. I'm, I'm trying to work out. I would like to read uh, the poem on the mules, the horses, as you talked first, a uh, poem uh, called Mules. Uh, and it's about human mules and about animal mules that we see. And this book, uh, this poem is my favorite poem. <clears throat> on the great Tibetan salt route, they meet me again, old forsaken friends. On their faces, fatigue of a drunken sleep. Their lives worn out, their legs twisted shaking from carrying illustrious flags of bleeding ascents. Age-long bells clinging to them like festering wounds, beating notes of a slavery that modernism brings, cartoons of icebergs, mineral water bottles, solar heaters, Chinese tiles, tin cans, carom boats, sacks of rice, and iodized salt from the plains of Nepal Karai. Butterflies of the terrace fields know their names, singing brooks, tempests of their breathless climbs. Traffic alert and time tested, they climb, carrying dreams of posh peacocks, pamphlets of a secret religious war, filth of an ecologist's trial semen, and tar kitchen for a cocktail party at the base camp. Defunct development agendas of guilty donors, the West's weird visions lusting for an instant purge. Stone steps of the mountains embossed on their drugged brains like lines of a boated love scratched on the historic rocks of water spouts. Starry skies of the dozing valleys know the ache of their secret sweat. Sunny days along the crystal rivers taste of their bleeding eyes. And the greatest fiction of their struggling lives lost like real mules clattering their hooves on the flagstones, encircling the cruel grandeur of bloodthirsty mule paths around the glacials of Annapurna. <laughs>
Peter, you're writing also a novel now. Yes. I've uh, nearly completed it. The only last part is remaining. I think my Europe visit will uh, help me in completing it. Because now I, I can, some of the characters, I had some Western characters, some uh, men and women. So now I can uh, understand more uh, clearly oh, how, what they did and why they did that. I can explain them more vividly. Uh, I can, because I now see the origins. And I can uh, depict them in more, uh, more powerfully and, and portray their inner warmth, their, their dynamism, their, 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 their inner, uh, you know, uh, the, the drama. I can depict now more powerfully and more graphically. So it has, my Europe visit will help me. And my novel is very, very magical. It is uh, more, uh, on, it's based in Annapurnas. And it's, uh, it's a Himalayan range. And a lot of yetis and a lot of uh, magic in the shamans and a lot of, uh, and, but then there's contemporary Nepal and contemporary Europe and uh, there's a lot of, uh, I'm like this character gets kidnapped by, mm, by Yeti and then by Maoists. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, it's uh, quite, uh, <laughs> and then all entire, uh, entire political, uh, pan-Indian yeah. political scenario comes uh, alive there. So it's, um, it's, it's quite, uh, I've been working for several years, so now it's, I'm nearly uh, looking for a, a publisher in New York and, and also in Europe. So, and also I'm working on translations of my poetry into, uh, into Dutch. Okay. And uh, my, uh, my uh, Dutch poets have been very kind to me. They have been very generous in translating uh, lots of uh, my poetry. And so I have already got nearly 15 poems. But you, <laughs> you made me really curi curious about one thing. I mean, you talk about the Yatis, right? Yes. So they exist? Uh, well, this is uh, a very interesting uh, thing because uh, Yatis, uh, that's what I'm saying. Uh, it exists to those who believe in them. <laughs> hmm. okay. if, you don't, if you don't believe in miracles, they won't happen to you. That's what uh, Western education does to us. We stop believing in miracles. In fact, uh, Yati is a mythological character. I say it's, it's pre-Buddhist kind of image. It's archetype. It's like demon mother goddess. And that, because Buddhism doesn't permit any violence, that was left out. So it became an abominable yeti, it became a horrif horrifying image. In fact, it is, uh, it is born, born, you know, pre-Buddhist pre yes, kind of uh, yes. uh, uh, creature. So uh, since it could not get an entry into Buddhism due to its violent character, because it's man-eating, it's a god mother goddess or kind of concept, gradually it, it became, it, it turned into this kind of shape. So historically speaking, if you anthropologically you look at it, yeti is a very crucial figure. Well, it's interesting because I was reading a, um, a book, uh, Voice of Tibet, Mm -hmm. And in this book, in, there is a story uh, of a man who actually saw a yeti in, uh, in the mountains of uh, Tibet. Yeah, this is uh, very mysterious and uh, there's a lot of, like I, uh, I also read many stories, even uh, very big figures uh, um, like Hilary uh, talks of um, going for a hunt for yeti. So yeti is very elusive and I now... Or, or selling products, you know. So it's all about magic, really. Yeah, magic. Uh, that you, even yeti happen. cannot do this or yeah, stuff like yeah, that. So uh, <laughs> it is. Uh, so my my yeti is female yeti. Yeah. My novel is more female. Yes. Uh, female yeti. That's what my uh, third book is called. Some female yeti. So I, I this is the main character who abducts the hero, and she mm, she is very magical. Yeti is actually a shaman. Is is the one who who abducts the new fights. The, the new new newcomers and takes them to his cave and teaches them the shamanic practices. Beautiful. I have met many several people who have told me of their experiences of being abducted by yeti and living with yeti. Is that right? Wow. I don't know, but it is. They say it is true that yeti took them. That yeti kept them. In uh, Nepali, we call banjhakri. Banjhakri forest shaman. So forest shaman like he abducts them. He teaches them magic, and then these people forever become possessed and they, they treat human ailments. He becomes a community doctor. He teaches the psychiatric, he's like a community psychiatrist. Yes. And he, he deals with the uh, complex problems. And so the shaman, it has to do with shamanism. It has to do with the shamanic healing practices. Yes. So yati is very significant. It's not just magic or it's not just, you know, it, it has more to do. It, it is very so, psych, sociologically, anthropologically, it's crucial. It's a very important character. Very interesting. And it's part of uh, the lost heritage. You know, that, uh, that like, 
Shamans were the first philosophers. And, it's, and, and, and with the modernization, it's getting lost. So, but there is, in, 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 in Nepal it's, or India, it's thriving, it's, it's alive. And pe people, people go to the shamans and they, and they get treated and they get, get all right. So it is, um, it's, it's very strange that, uh, so in that way, I, I have been doing uh, Yati's research and I have even edited a book by an American author called uh, Larry Peters. He has his, his books on Nepalese shamanism and on Yati. So I've been uh, doing a lot of research in this. So, so Yati has entered my... Because then you have a book, you know, which is, where is it? It's, uh, it's yeah. here, I think. And, uh, some female Yati. Yeah, that's right. I mean, here it is. It's a some female <laughs> Yati. <laughs> This is really, it's a beautiful painting yes, as well. I mean, yes. uh, very, very nice. Well, in, there's an interesting story behind it that uh, uh, this female Yati uh, abducts, uh, Yati comes and abducts this boy who's standing there. He's grazing uh, his, his sheep and he sees a small speck in the ground and he says he was starts concentrating on it and all of a sudden the speck starts growing. It grows so big, it becomes a huge uh, monster. Then he faints. And then next day he turns him, finds himself to be in a cave. And he is caged by Yati. Yati loves him so much, she would not let him go. But he says, I want to go out. But Yati gives him food, makes love to him, makes him stay there. But then Yati loves the boy so much that one day she agrees to take him out. And then it becomes a practice. They start moving out, taking evening walks in the snow. And one day Yati is so much engrossed with this boy that she falls in love with him and she forgets that they reach the village. And there the Lama, the priest, everybody see them and they catch hold of them. And they put Yati, imprison the Yati in the, in the monastery. And they try to take the boy and do the blessing on him and try to cure him of the, of the evil impact of Yati. And they lock the monastery. And in the morning, when everything's all right, they go back and they open the lock of the um, monastery. And they find there's no Yati, only his footprints are. So this is the tale behind it. But it's about a, about a woman who tries to possess you, uh, or hu any human being, who tries to possess you, control you, and put you in. So it's about possession, possession, and it's about uh, liberation. And it is, it's a folk tale. This is a beautiful, interesting topic. I mean, yes, we yes, can yes, talk yes. for a long time, you know, yes. with this. I will have one question, and that is, uh, what's your favorite place in Himalaya? Uh, well, Annapurna's, of course, and uh, and also uh, I and like uh, it, you know, I like one place which uh, we are earlier talking and you talked of Marfa. Marfa is very Marfa. beautiful. It's beautiful. There are apples, uh, you know, apple wine and apple apple farming, and it's windy and it's so beautiful and it's quiet and the stone slab streets. It's, it's the most beautiful place that I think I have been. Very nice. Thank you very much. I think we can um, um, we will have you to read you know some of your poetry. Yes. From, uh, from your latest book here, The Lake, the lake Pu and a Horse. Yes. That's uh, how you came about with this title. Uh, the Lake Feva is the uh, lake which is in, based in Pokhara. And, uh, that's, uh, uh, and this horse, you know, horse is symbolic of, uh, of uh, human activity. Yes. Uh, because horse does everything. Mules, they, are, they carry the loads up to the mountains. And this has been a tra traditional salt route. Uh, on which uh, the trade was done. It's very traditional salt route since ancient times. So, and uh, horse has been very important. So, horse represents human, and uh, lake represents uh, you know the nature. Yes. So it, it has a uh, uh, lot of I, I play with this how uh, horse is sad and how nature is getting dis destroyed by um, you know human That's encroachment. Beautiful. And so it's uh, interesting. The lake favor a horse. Yes. I thank you very much. Yes. I mean here we. We got into so many different topics, and then we can talk about so much as well. And I think would be the best way we can uh, we can conclude with you, uh, maybe um, with the poetry of yours. Yes. Yeah. I'd like to read a small poem, uh, which is uh, generally called my best poems. The poem is called Best Poems. It's four line poem, Best Poems. The kisses you refused were the best. The kisses you refused were the best, like the poems on the lake, favor I did not write. Oh, beautiful.
from the my new collection, uh, the Lake Cave and a Horse. The first poem about the lake, I begin with this and then I shall talk more about uh, the locale of the poem. A rainbow. Rain walks over the chest of the lake. Rain walks over the chest of the lake, making it alive with its lover's electric touch, tense, taut. But then it stops, this rain drumming the belly of the lake. A lonely boat appears somewhere between shafts of sunlight. And then I want to read the poem uh, called River. Because uh, when you travel in the mountains, Nepal has the highest mountains of the world. And interestingly, even on those in highest mountains, in those glacial heights, there are villages, there are people living, there is culture, there is dance, there is life there. So there is whole drama of human life going on there. Even on those alpine heights. So this is my favorite poem called River that I read here. Between your marble shoulders and my hairy chest, the river roaring, tears, tears, tears. Between your marble shoulders and my hairy chest, the river roaring, tears, tears, tears. Between your mellowing mouth and my center tongue, a night of flames and flesh and flesh and flesh. Between your hefty thighs and my throbbing hands, clouds drunk from the forest of rhododendrons, rhododendrons, rhododendrons. Between your almond eyes and my warm mouth, rain dropping like pearls of green leaves of the jungle. Between your shimmering skin and my dark hair, grass greener than the greenest parakeet, growing yellowish from incessant rain. Between your nights by the important pillow of your husband and my crazed headpiece. A poem of spring that shall fill my deep wounds, sprouting flowers, flowers, flowers. Between your tulips and my fragrant pen, a brain fever bird's crazed cry, mad, mad, mad. Between the sparkle of your teeth and my sleep, a rain coming like a roar of a starving stream in the starless summer gloom of the night. Between your melon breasts, and thrust of my soft lips, the rage of the river battering its head against the magic mountains, between your decisions and my flickering lamps, the river mad. Between your decisions and my flickering lamps, the river mad, you, you poet, you bastard, go away. Uh, then I want to read a poem about uh, uh, birthplace of Buddha. You know, Buddha was born in... Uh, Lumbani, a place on on Nepal Indian border, on in, on Nepal side. Uh, this place uh, in uh, on the Nepal Tarai border uh, called uh, Lumbani. And uh, Maya Devi, mother of was walking, and as she was pregnant, she had this pain, and there was a pond, and by the side of the pond under a tree, she gave birth to Buddha. And years later, a, uh, the great emperor Ashoka visited that place. And you, today you can go to Nepal and in the Lumbani, the birthplace of Buddha, you can see the stone pillars inscription of Ashoka, the great emperor. But interestingly, when I went there, I found that on the place where the world's greatest emperor of peace was born, some violence was taking place, even there. So the question of war and peace is very tricky. Even on the most sacred place, on the most pious place, I found violence. I found a pigeon had just killed. A pigeon had just been killed by a cat. And she was licking her paws. So this poem uh, called Lumbani on uh, the birthplace of Buddha, uh, which lies uh, in Nepal Tarai. Green Pond's face is scarred with stains of blood. Green Pond's face is scarred with stains of blood. 
as silence rustles in the banyan tree, whose branches carrying a bird of ill omen shake over the tremulous pond, quivering from an unknown agenda of violence. I circle the pond, expecting some survivor to emerge any moment out from the waters where Maya Devi, Buddha's mother, took bath before giving birth to world's emperor of peace. Wind bellows in the ferns of the blazing fields of Nepal Tarai. Desperate call of a nightingale, probably dying of a sunstroke, shrieking like a widow on the simmering rim of a high noon. Beside the lonely Ashoka pillar, a wild cat licks her paws clean of the blood of the freshly paid pigeon and prepares her siesta near the damp edge of a water well. In a nishi, dug in the mossy trunk of cool banyan tree, a sleeping Buddha lies, shedding tears from his half-closed lotus eyes. A turtle, along with three babes, alert on the slippery steps of the queasy pond, raises her serpent spectator neck above her safe shell to watch a fluffy pile of pigeon feeders floating like a tiny pagoda of peace on the bleeding waters of Lumbani. Uh, then I want to read a poem from uh, my earlier uh, collection called Sampi Maliyati. And uh, I want to read uh, and the title poem, but before that, I might uh, like to read a small poem uh, on uh, Buddha. Because Buddha is uh, very, uh, very much, pop, very much known in the West. In fact, I never saw so many statues of Buddha, so many, you know, rich statues, so many ex exquisite statues of Buddha as I saw them in Europe. Every shop, every window, uh, there are uh, Buddha statues. And so I read uh, uh, one of uh, the poems on Buddha. Dream of a death in, mar in the middle of a marketplace. Dream of a death in the middle of a marketplace a mire of spit semen and sapatri, a cacophony of cruel barbers shaving the glossy hair of the mountain of your chest, this the victory of the hairy mound of a tree that is to strangle the breath of blue pagoda one day, this the question of the potency of his trial horoscope, this the chaos of majestic butchers of illusions. This the chaos of majestic butchers of illusions. This the secret palace of rhododendrons. Tearing through the fragrant domains of scarlet petticoats, you stepped out into the fields of light, leaving behind a young wife, Yashodara, in the middle of an orgasm. Well, I have been writing uh, some poems inspired by a uh, Euro European uh, wizard. Uh, some poems on Den Haag and Frankfurt. Uh, I shall like to read one of uh, those. Uh, I, I have a short one uh, before on uh, Den Haag. Window dolls. In the lanes of Nordin Den Haag is the window dolls. In the lanes of Nordin Den Haag or in the streets of Amsterdam is the window dolls that you would see everywhere like idols of 84,000 Hindu gods on the streets of Varanasi or Kathmandu. And everywhere dogs trotting along humans like lusts frozen along the lonely evenings on the leash and taking them to be the idols of a shrine. And taking them to be the idols of the shrine, I sometimes bow to them, fearing their powers and prime. And this poem about Frankfurt, uh, the last poem, Frankfurt. Freckled shell of God city turns out to be the soft meat of the donor. Freckled shell of the God city turns out to be the soft meat of a donor. I wipe myself clean of the dust of the miracles that I have carried like a bird across the oceans. Having traveled so far, what difference you think does it make between fiction and reality, between shell and kernel? Says George, as his girlfriend blows her cute little nose unabashedly in my presence. 
sex shops, gay saloons, arrows, the nude sculptures in the balcony, ogres in the underground metro stations, orgasms in the to station toilets, pointed tip of the blunt Turkish knife on the soft throat of a newcomer. In the square next to EU commercial center, an artist draws his penny painting on the pavement, or a singer kicking his heels at the top of his voice gets just a whistle from a teenage girl, not sale of his CD. Walking on the heels of hunger, he knows not it's just an obsession here to polish everything clean, including the syllables of survival that he has picked up in this land of chilled anger, where once a man walked like a demigod, where once he dug graves for the living, where once he furled a fettered flag familiar and fluttering unabashedly in my own land today. In the chilled air, I walk on the side stone walks, only to see my own shadow reflected on the glassy walls of the skyscrapers. But then Judith's face touches the tail of a horse, where once a Buddha lived, a touch of autumn that I have left behind in my own Annapurnas. George sits home, waiting for Susanna, like a housewife. Obediently, he shops in the supermarkets, weighing each penny like a grandma. He feeds the recycle machine empty, bottle, em empty bottles to get a euro in return. And I start speaking a language of husbands that I have mastered on the guards of Ganges, a secret invective, an uncanny repertory of bandits. Judith's face keeps flaring like silvery peaks of Annapurna's. Fishtail of her golden head bobbing like a halo of lust denied to human beings. Thank you very much. The poems on the Lake Feva I did not write. You Yutsu are the charm. Thank you very much for, for being here today, for sharing your thoughts and your knowledge we thank you very much for that. Thank you very much. I enjoyed um, sharing my experiences with, your, uh, with you and uh, with uh, the viewers. And it is a, uh, is a proud, uh, I'm proud, and it's a great golden opportunity for me to share uh, the, some of the suffering and some of the pleasure, some of the joys and some of the uh, rhapsodies of my world. Beautiful. Thank, thank you very And much. we're going to have you um, also for a storytelling night. Thank you. And that will be December the 9th. We have the storytelling night, tells of power, and um, you will be with us. I'm, I'm privileged and I'm honored to be. So keep tuned for that as well. That was going to be December the 9th, and uh, we'll, um, you can see the information uh, here on the screen where you can find more details about it. So please take note, and uh, we welcome to come here and share an evening of tales, and uh, I'm really looking forward to see what kind of tale you're gonna bring you know, from, uh, from Nepal. <laughs> Thank you very much again. <laughs> Good evening to everybody. Thank you. <laughs>